welcome to this short uh, video on long and short acting opioids. And what I hope to do with this video is really just explain a little bit more about why we have short and long acting opioids because it's something that often people get very confused about and that then results in inappropriate prescribing for patients. So, probably the best way to explain this is to go through a couple of um, hypothetical cases and really just show you in each case what the various drugs are contributing to that patient's pain relief. Now the first thing to say is that for patients, pain isn't a constant. Most patients will have variations in their level of pain throughout the day and that's a normal phenomenon. And essentially that's why we have long and short acting opioids. So let's just sort of um, take an illustration and let's take a patient where if we draw a graph and uh, on the y-axis is their pain intensity and we're used to asking patients to sort of score from zero to 10, and we'll use that on this graph. And then if we sort of on the x-axis have time throughout the day. Now, for a typical patient, what we might see is that their pain intensity sort of throughout the day does this kind of thing. So essentially for this patient, what we're seeing is that throughout the day, they've got a moderate amount of pain that's there all the time. But on top of that, at various points in the day, they get these peaks of pain. And that's normal. Um, for a lot of patients, you know, a peak of pain might happen first thing in the morning when they're getting up out of bed. And this might be when they're doing something particularly active throughout the day. Um, but this sort of pattern is, is fairly typical uh, of what we see for most patients. Now, what long and short acting opioids do is try and tailor the patient's pain relief to this variation in pain levels that we see patients having throughout the day. So to take a long-acting opioid uh, preparation, so for instance, MS-Compton or OxyContin, if you put the patient on that regularly, what they've got is they've got a long-acting opioid that's gonna stay in their system um, throughout the day. And what you would hope that happens is that that kind of sort of takes care of this background pain and manages to analgese the patient for most of their pain throughout the day. But what you don't do with that is you can't take care of these sort of peaks of pain that occur through the day. And that's why we have short acting opioids those are opioids like uh, Ordine or Endone. And what they do is they get into your system fairly quickly, within about 10 or 15 minutes, and give you a boost of analgesia that hopefully takes care of these peak episodes. And again, for a typical patient, if you've got them on a long-acting opioid and a short-acting opioid together, what you might see is a patient typically using their breakthrough medication two or three times a day, and that's normal. However, that's not the only scenario we see, and what we'll look at next is what you might find with a patient who's got incident pain or movement-related pain. Okay, so next we're going to have a look at a slightly different scenario, and this is more typical of patients who've got incident pain. So again, we'll draw a graph, and the same axes will have pain intensity, uh, 10 to 0, 
stroke and times throughout the day. But some patients, what you find is actually they have fairly low levels of background pain. Um, but they get these quite intense spikes of pain throughout the course of the day. Um, so your typical patient might be someone who's got axial skeletal mets so that every time they move or try to mobilize, they load their spine and they get lots of intense pain. But actually, when they're at rest, um, lying comfortably in bed, they're pretty comfortable and they don't need a lot of analgesia. Now in a patient like this, um, the first thing to say is actually these spikes are more frequent because it's every time the patient moves. So as particularly active patients, that might be six, seven, eight times a day. Um, and the intensity is much greater. Um, so where you might use long acting and short acting opioids here, um, going to be a little bit different. You might actually only need very little, if any, background long acting opioid. But the patient's going to depend much more heavily and more frequently on uh, breakthrough analgesia to deal with these little spikes that we get. Um, and so as a consequence, you'll find that your patient is using things like audine and endone more frequently, uh, perhaps closer together, um, and in bigger doses relative to what their background opioid is going to be. So, these two sort of cases indicate that actually not every patient is the same. We do have to tailor our analgesia um, to individual patients. And next I'm going to kind of run through where if we get the prescription of the drugs wrong, uh, we can actually um, cause some adverse effects. Okay, so one of the problems that we sometimes see um, people having difficulty with is, is actually sort of um, interpreting the use um, of a patient's breakthrough analgesia. Um, and probably the best way to, to illustrate this is to again just to go through a case. and. Um, what we'll do again, same axes, um, and I'll probably make this a, a patient that's a, a little bit of a, a hybrid of the, uh, of the previous uh, couple of patients. So this is a patient who's having a few different uh, pain episodes uh, through the day of various intensities. Now, sometimes what we see um, prescribers doing in error is looking at the patient's use of breakthrough and they look at the pain chart or they look at the, the drug card X and they see that this patient has had um, you know, five episodes of extra analgesia. And the mistake that often gets made is that that's interpreted that that's not satisfactory or that that's somehow a failure of the patient's analgesia, uh, even if they're taking you know, appropriate short-acting opioid here and they've got you know, a moderate amount of background opioid that's taking care of, of all this background pain. But they look at that and they think, that's not good enough. I need to do something more to get the patient better analgesia. In effect, trying to sort of see if they can get rid of these breakthrough episodes. And often what people do then is they increase the background analgesia. So whereas we're sort of here, they'll increase the analgesia to this sort of level, which does happen to sort of knock out a couple of these more intense episodes. But it doesn't get rid of them all. And what you then see is that you've got 
background analgesia that is actually surplus to requirements for these episodes throughout the day. The patient's actually getting more opioid than they actually need for analgesia um, the vast majority of the time. But what you then see is we get into this sort of vicious circle where, again, there's still some breakthroughs needed and, and we're trying to get rid of those and we put the background up again. And we actually make the situation even worse because now we've got loads more background allergies than we need most of the time. And the result of that is that you end up making the patient opioid toxic, they become drowsy, they get all the side effects, hallucinations, they become agitated. That sometimes then feeds into the belief, because the patient's still having some episodes of pain and they're getting agitated, that their pain's getting even worse and we need to increase the background analgesia again. And we just get into this vicious circle of over-prescribing opioids. So, the key to this is to understand that actually don't interpret a patient needing breakthrough analgesia as a failure uh, or that it's something that we've got to get rid of. Um, what we need to be using is long-acting opioids in the background and short-acting opioids with a frequency that's appropriate for the patient's pain. And if that's okay, then we've got things right. Okay, I hope you've enjoyed this uh, short video and um, look forward to seeing you for some more short clips.